two verses in the Bible that, that Shangar is mentioning in there. Like uh, the prayer of Jay says, you know, if you're not careful, you'll, you'll overlook something good. You don't want to do that, do we? Let's turn to Judges chapter number five. Chapter number five, we're going to read verse six to start with here. It says, In the days of Shemgar, the son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were unoccupied. And the travelers walked through the byways. I had never, uh, never studied Shamgar out at all before this week, and I found that that verse right there strange. It says that the highways were unoccupied, and I, I kind of dug into that a little bit, and I, I wondered why they were unoccupied. I mean, if you wanted to go to just say me camp, you go out here. It, why can't we open old 421 and new 421 the highway? That's the way you go. But these people were taking paths across the mountain and would not use the highway. And as I studied it out, I, I found out that the enemy had become so great and so many, the Philistines, and so violent that the people were afraid to use the highway. So they had to make paths through the woods so they could stay in. They were afraid of the enemy. Why? Because the enemy had taken over. They did exactly what they wanted to, exactly when they wanted to, and exactly how they wanted to, and the people were simply afraid to use them. And I kind of compared this in my mind to the world that we live in today. Does it seem to anybody else in here that the enemy has kind of taken over the world we live in today? Hey, go ahead. Now think about this just for a minute. They do exactly what they want to. They do exactly when they want to. Exactly how they want to. And we as Christians, we almost go to certain places in, that I can think of that I would be afraid to go, like James said this morning, and, and just share my testimony with somebody. There are places you can beat up or shot or hurt for saying that you're a Christian. And I'm talking about in America. There are places that we are afraid to stand up for what's right. We are afraid to stand up and share our testimony. And we are afraid to stand up against anything that's wrong. Now, the world we live in today, the criminal has more rights than the police officer. Amen. The LGBTQ, whatever it's called, you know, they, have, they took over the schools. Uh, anything that we know as Christians that is wrong, we have to be almost afraid to speak out against it, to say anything against it, or to do anything against it. Don't we? Does anybody else see that? Okay. You say, I'm, well, I'm not afraid. I'll do it, okay? Let's see, head up to King Street and, and invite people to the Cornerstone Missionary Baptist Church or to the college. Anybody here ever done that? Did you raise your hand? We got one hand up in here. There it is. Okay? That's not, not a comfortable place to be in. I would be afraid to do that. That's the honest truth about it. Not afraid probably of, of something violent happening to me, but afraid of the ridicule. Okay? Let's see you go on uh, some liberal site on Facebook and say, I'm a Christian and this is wrong. What are they going to do to you? They're going to put you in Facebook jail, right? I knew there was such thing. <laughs> Raise your hand if you've ever been in Facebook jail. Well, we've got a bunch of rebels in here. We've got four. <laughs> Facebook jail. Who would have thought of that? But these are the highways that we use. Now, we can use Twitter. We can use Facebook. We can use word of mouth. But 
we are afraid to go in certain, on certain places of these highways and do what's right. Just like these people were back in Shamar today. Okay? You see, the highways that we use today, they're different than the ones they used back then. But it's the same kind of fear. So, somebody tell me what we're supposed to do. If we're, if we're afraid, and, and America is not the same way it is here in the, the southeast of the United States, all of America is not that way. This is the only place on planet Earth that you get mad at one church, you drive a half a mile down the road, there's another church you can go to. If you leave right here, you can go to five or six churches within a mile range right here. The, America is not like that. So somebody tell me what we're supposed to do in these situations where we probably should say that's wrong, but we are afraid to. One guess. That's right. If we if we take that, okay, the issue with the criminals having more rights than the police. The truth is, the police should have the right to do whatever they think right at the time to protect and serve the people that are, are paying them to protect and serve. Right. But it's not that way. The truth is missing right there. The LGBTQ T or whatever it is, I can't get all the initials in the right order most of the time. If we believe what this word says, and I do, that's wrong. But the truth is missing there. things in your personal life. When uh, the enemy comes in like a flood. And sometimes it seems that there's not a standard grace against it, but there always is. When you are going through these trials and you're going through these things that put fear in your heart, what are you supposed to do in this situation? Now I want you to see, Shamgar had an enemy here. He, they were so afraid to, to just live day to day that they had to to sneak through the woods. They couldn't even take the, the shortest route to where they need to go. They live constantly in fear. And if you've been in the right situation in your own heart, you've lived in that same kind of fear. I've done it before in, in the past. I've lived day to day in some kind of fear that most of the time I put myself in. So what are we supposed to do in that situation? What have we got to stand on? Where do we go to, to, to fight this enemy off? Good. Now back up one page. Let's read the other verse of Shem Garden. Judges chapter number three, we'll go to verse number thirty one. <laughs> and after him was Shemgar, the son of Adam, which slew of, of the Philistines six hundred men with an ox goat, and he also delivered Israel. So he found deliverance in him. Underline the word right there, he delivered Israel. That last little phrase right there. So we need deliverance from the enemy. Either in our personal lives or out in the world where we're afraid to, to do the things that we know that are right. We want to travel on these modern highways and we want to do it and not be afraid. We want to be on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, word of mouth, workplace, whatever. Whatever situation it is, we should be able to share the fact that we're a Christian and not live in fear because of it. We should live our life day to day and not live in some kind of fear in our own heart or our own, our own brain and our own life. Thank you. 
to speed. That's good, Philip. Okay. Now, we talk about, especially here in Montauga County, I've noticed it a lot, acceptance. There are certain things that we are to accept. And I don't want to accept this anything that's too out in front of me, do you? But what I've noticed about this acceptance crowd is they're willing to accept everybody until you say you're a Christian. But if you're a Christian, you are unaccepted. Why is that? Because you carry some form of that very quickly. When you are a Christian and you live a Christian life, they have to see the truth in your life. That's exactly right. They do not want to accept you because you stand up. Just your lifestyle will stand up against the things that they are trying to force on you. So Shamgar delivered Israel from enemy. Somebody tell me how he done that. Stood up and fought. Shamgar, the son of Anath, which slew of the Philistines 600 men with an ox goat. Now, he slew 600 men. And, you know, that's kind of the numbers that Samson would come up with. And we, uh, he only has two verses in the entire word of God. He slew 600 men with a farmer's loot. And, and we've overlooked that. Now, I'm not telling you to go out and, and slay 600 people. Of course, that would be foolish. But that's not what I'm talking about. He went out and slayed 600 of the enemy. But he done it on physical terms. And the wars that we fight are on spiritual terms. We fight spiritual wars. We, we believe that we have a Savior, and it's a spiritual Savior. It's on a spiritual level, not a physical level. And that's what we're talking about this morning. Right. So the liberal acceptance crowd is not the enemy. We have to remember that. Although they do act like it. We are to not be angry with them. We are not to uh, use violence against them the way that a lot of the time they use against us. They are not the enemy. We have to understand that. The enemy is who? Satan. And he is in control of that situation. Now, he makes them look like our enemy when they're really not. They are the people that we should be working to win for Christ. When we fight, we should always know that Satan is the enemy. That's the person that we're fighting against, the, the spirit, the entity, I guess, that we're fighting against, not the people in the world, and especially not each other, not the other people in the church that we tend to want to fight against sometimes. Don't we? Now, I thought of a good example of this. This is a perfect illustration of how Satan tricks us in our life. I got an uncle, and his mother was still alive at the time. She had uh, dementia. And, of course, they kept taking her to the doctor. He gave her different kinds of medicines, and finally he put her on this medicine. And my uncle said it did not work. And he said that he got frustrated with the doctor, and almost got to the point of taking that doctor and he'd say, I want you to take her off that medicine. It don't work. And he would not do it. Okay? And he said he kept praying. Lord, please make the medicine work. Please help mom. Make the medicine work. Work in your life. Do this, that, and the other. And finally, God spoke to him and said, you need to pray for the doctor. That's exactly how Satan works in our life. He wants to use distraction. He wants to make you hate the person next to you when it's really him, you should be fighting against. Okay, my uncle said she began to pray for the doctor, and within a week or two, he changed the medicine and she started improving. Now that's a simple way that Satan uses to trick you into warring against each other, against the people that really are not your enemy. We have to remember, Satan is the enemy. When somebody in life comes against you, it's because Satan calls that situation to happen. Right? Amen. The doctor never was the enemy of, of the, the lady that saved her, my uncle. So our enemy is always Satan. And he uses the world around us to kill us, to steal from us, and to destroy us if he gets the opportunity. But he's the one called the God. He's the one for the strength. So we want deliverance from that, don't we? 
just like Shamgar, he delivered Israel to it. And he delivered it through the slaying of the enemy, the physical enemy. But the church will be delivered through the slaying of the enemy, spiritually. So, let's, let's read this verse again here. And after him was Shamgar, the son of Adam, which slew of the Philistines six hundred men with an ox head, and he also delivered Israel. Okay? Now, as we move on here, think about your personal life. The enemies that come against you, maybe uh, depression, or anxiety, or financial problems, or uh, physical problems. There's always an enemy out to get you, right? And we want deliverance from that enemy. Now, we said that Satan is the enemy that causes the, the, the world to come against us. But there's enemies that come into our personal life that we have to know how to war and fight against. Whatever it is in your life that's holding you back, uh, whatever part of you that you're afraid of, you have to remember that you are part of the army of God. So mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, financially, whatever situation that you're in that puts that fear in your heart, you have to remember you are a soldier in God's army. And with God, all things are possible. So how did Shamgar deliver Israel? And we see that he delivered Israel and he's only in two verses. But deliverance came. Somebody tell me one thing that he done to deliver Israel that comes out of this verse number 31. He fought. How did he fight? Good. I got three points for you today. It says that he slayed 600 of the Philistines with nothing more than an oxen. But in order to win this war and deliver Israel, he started where he was at. You have to understand that he was more than likely a farmer. We can see that by the weapon that he used. Uh, he was a blue collar man of some kind. It's pretty obvious because he was physical uh, enough to be a warrior. He was not a king. He was not a soldier. He was not a celebrity. And you have to remember that just like Shamgar, whatever position you're in right now is where you have to start from. If you are going to find deliverance, if you are going to ha have some miracle in your life, no matter what it is that you need, where you are right now where you're sitting is where you're going to start from in order to get. It's not just going to fall out of the sky. It's going to require you making some kind of start toward this. Uh, if you refuse to start, you will always be a slave to whatever enemy you face. So, we should never wait to see what your life's going to become. Why? Because when you wait, when you refuse to start in the direction that you know that you need to start in, you're going to keep waiting and you're going to keep waiting. And eventually, you're going to look back and you've waited all your life for just simple deliverance to fall out of the sky that you should have been working for the whole time. Shamgar had to start in the direction of victory in order to achieve victory. It don't happen without effort. You know, everybody in here knows I like ground racing. The starting line is where the victory is won 90% of the time. 10% of the time it's at the finish line. But you have to be on that starting line in order to get to the finish line. There is no other way to achieve victory. Amen. You have to start somewhere. And right where you're sitting, right now, is the place you're going to have to start. The second thing that Samgar used, or the second thing that he'd done to achieve victory, he used what he had. Which obviously is an oxygen. Somebody tell me what is an oxygen. Good. I had to look it up on the internet. It's a, a stick that's about four feet long. And it's got a sharp metal point on the end of it. And it's got a hook behind the point that pulls, points back towards the person that's using it. It looks just like a fire But it's about four feet long made out of wood. 
Then the ox, if it stops doing its job, you give it a poke and it takes off and starts working again. If you need the guide ox, you take the hook, hook it in so on and pull it around to where it needs to go. It's as simple as it could possibly be. But this is what he used to slay the enemy. He used what he had. But why? Because that's all he had. He's, his resources were very limited. But when we look at our resources in our life, what do we do? We look at somebody else's resources. If I could preach like Eric, I could do it. Or if I could play the bass like Doug, I could do it. Or sing like Doug, I could do it. If I had what you've got, I could do it. But you fail to see the resources that you have in your hand that God gave you. Amen. And I do this all the time myself. You know, Joe has talent to, to, to play the drums and sing. If, if I could do what Joe can do, I could do it. But I have my own talents. I have my own resources. And that's the things that I have to use. I can't use Joe's talent. I can't use Eric for Cindy or anybody in your talent. I have to use the things that God gave me. God gave uh, this man, Chamgar, and Oxgate. And he swayed the enemy. And you will use what you got or you won't use anything. But we tend to make excuses. You have to use what you've got. You have to use the talent, the ability, the gifts, whatever it is that God's given you. You have to use the resource that you have in your hand. Now think about Moses. When he stood before God, God said, what have you got in your hand? And he said, a staff. But once he realized the resource that he had in his hand, look at the miracles that he done with it. He put it before Pharaoh and it started to grow branches on it. He threw it on the floor and it became a snake and he had to run from it. He threw it on the floor in front of uh, Pharaoh and it became a snake and it ate the other two snakes. But once he realized the resource that he had, he knew that he could use it. That God was in it. That God had gave it to him. And when you realize the resource that you have in your life, you know then that you have it to use. Somebody tell me what your resource is. One person. Play me out. Good. If we got one, we got another one. Here's something we're surely on. Good. Uh, looking on Angie's Facebook one day and there's a 
a little club on there that uh, is something about Ford V8 motors or something like that that I'm on. But this fella had his car for it. And he went on there and asked the simplest question about how to fix his car, and you wouldn't believe some of the responses how stupid they, people started calling him. And he was on there asking for help. It's, it's insanity is what it is. Puts it. The miracle 
is not in what you don't have, but the miracle is in what you have in your hand. You're never going to receive a miracle from what you don't have. You're going to have to use the resources that God has given you. Okay, stop focusing on what you don't have. Think about David. He had limited resources. He had a sling, and he had five smooth stones that God provided for him. And we know that Goliath had a sword, a shield, a spear, a helmet, an armor bearer, armor. Goliath had seemingly unlimited resources. But David had what God gave him. He had it in his hand, and he used it for God's good. He put that uh, that God provided, as limited as it seemed, and God provided the miracle. And victory was the outcome. So the things that God puts in your hand to use are going to be the things that God uses to bring the miracle into your life that you need. No matter what it is. The third thing that he done, he did what he could do. And that's all we can do. What can you do? The first thing you can do is pray. Uh, the fellow named Bill Bright said, it's impossible to over-exaggerate the importance of prayer. Jesus said in John 14, 13, and whatever you ask in my name, that will I do. And I love this quote here. It says, don't forget, your enemies are helpless against your prayer. Who is our enemy? Satan is our enemy. And when we speak prayers to God, Satan is helpless against us. What else can you do? You can focus on God, focus on His Word, and focus on the solution instead of the problem. Where are we going to get the solution to our problem from? The Bible. That's where we're going to get the solutions to our problems from. The other thing that we can do is we can stay focused on our vision. Raise your hand if you've got a vision in your life. Now, right here's something that I had never thought of. What's the best way to destroy your vision? Huh? Nope. It's not the easiest way. Because you still have the vision. The easiest way to destroy your vision is to get another vision. Because it's impossible to focus on two things at once. When you have two visions, you have to be busy. <laughs> Satan, the enemy, is great at trying to discourage us. He's also great at giving us a vision that's almost as good as the first vision for us to focus on. The vision that God gives you in your life is the best possible vision that you can have. Amen. Second best is just that. Second best. Paul said, this one thing that I do, not the sticky things that I do. Paul was a preacher. Paul was a church plan. Paul was a missionary. Paul's focus, his vision, was to further God's cause. That was his vision. Paul didn't focus on other things. That's all he wanted in his life. He had a vision. He said, focus on it. And he went after it all the way to death. And finally, turn over to uh, Joshua 1. Joshua 1. speak against it in your life. In other words, if you need healing, 
You speak healing verses if you're like. Somebody give me a healing verse. By his stripes we are healed. When you feel sick, when you feel something coming on, say, by your stripes, I've been healed, Lord. You speak that into your life. You don't go around saying, I think I'm getting sick. You are speaking that into your life when you do that. The things that you speak into your life are the things that are going to manifest in a very short amount of time. Also remember, the things that you speak into your children's life are going to manifest over all their life. From the time you speak it until the time they die. That is what is going to grow in their life. The Word of God, the Bible says, the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword and a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. That's Hebrews 4.12. So what's it saying? It's saying it's a weapon. The, the Bible is your weapon against the enemy that comes in. It's better than an oxygen. Not only can you read it, but it can read you. When you read the Bible, it reads you right back. In order to be understood, it has to be read. But in order to be read, in, when it's read, it has to be understood. They go hand in hand. The Bible is your only weapon against the enemy. When sickness comes into your life, when fear of some kind comes into your life, your Bible is what you have to fight that off with. And you have to read it, you have to meditate it, you have to know what it says, and you have to be able to speak it when that shows up. What does that require? Hiding the word in your heart. You have to know what it says. And when we meditate on it, when we focus on it, when we speak it, look what happens. Look at the last part of that verse right there. After you do all these things, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous. That sounds good, don't it? And thou shalt have good success in your life. The Word is the key to all of that. The Word is the answer to all your questions. And you have to read it, and you have to know what it says. That would be great. Thank you. 